Hey, greetings, and welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. Uh, as always, I am your host, Lockie and Liberal, and I do want to thank you all so much for being here with me today. Now, if you happen to be new to the program, I want to welcome you. This is a podcast where we are going to be using legal theory and moral philosophy to discuss current events related to law, politics, and culture. Now, today, we are going to be talking about how it is that the Second Amendment became a second-class right. Uh, before we get into that real quick, I just want to remind you guys something. I have recently opened up a couple avenues for uh, helping to support the show financially. If you are uh, able to do that, uh, you can either uh, go to PayPal or Venmo by scanning those QR codes on your screen right now, or you can just follow the links in the description. I've also opened up a Patreon page. And if you go to the Patreon page, uh, I have a post up there uh, that explains kind of why uh, I'm looking for uh, support from you guys uh, on an ongoing basis like this and what I hope to do with the show and uh, what uh, you could help me do if you're able to put a couple bucks uh, a month behind the show and become a patron of mine. Uh, so go and check any or all of those out. Uh, anyways, yeah, enough horn myself out. Let's get to the topic for today. So as I said, uh, the main theme of today is going to be how the Second Amendment became a second class right. Now, this is coming uh, very specifically from uh, a case that was just handed down yesterday, actually, by the Ninth Circuit Court. And in an opinion uh, given uh, by an en banc hearing for a case that has been moving through the court since 2011, uh, that you may have heard of, it, it was known as Young v. Hawaii. Now, this case has been one of uh, extreme interest to uh, not only constitutional lawyers, but Second Amendment advocates, and uh, just people who have the radical notion that the natural right of armed self-defense requires the ability to have the arms on your person to defend yourself. Now, this has been a fundamental right Throughout liberal philosophy, I mean, it goes all the way back to Aristotle, to Machiavelli. Uh, we find it from Harrington, Locke, Rousseau, Beccaria, uh, and we find it in law as well. We find it in the English common law, at least as early as the statutes of Northampton, uh, which were uh, first, char er, first uh, drafted in 1328. Now, a somewhat more limited a uh, version of the same right was found under the English Declaration of Rights of 1689. Uh, and then by the time we get to 1765, we have the great English jurist William Blackstone in his great treatise on the common law, uh, in which he discussed this, and he said, The fifth and last auxiliary right of the subject that I shall uh, at present mention is that of having arms for defense, which is also declared by the same and is indeed a public allowance under due restriction with the natural right of resistance and self-preservation when the sanctions of society and laws are found insufficient to restrain the violence of oppression. Now, James Madison uh, saw his draft of the Second Amendment as securing the English common law right that was recognized in the Bill of Rights of 1689, uh, and he saw it as sort of the completion or the culmination of that right. That right had a lot of restrictions on it. Uh, as I said, uh, for example, under the English game laws, uh, where Charles II had uh, passed these laws under a very specious pretext uh, that open carry of arms was a threat to the vast hunting grounds reserved for the nobility. Now, uh, when we get to uh, early American times, we find in uh, St. George Tucker's Great Treatise on the Constitution, which was uh, released in 1803, uh, he referred to the individual right to keep and carry arms as the true palladium of liberty. And then we have uh, certainly the most prolific uh, founder, as far as the Second Amendment goes, who was Tench Cox, and he spoke of uh, private arms at length. Uh, on many different occasions, but uh, for one example, he said that uh, private arms are the second and better right hand of every freeman, and that the Constitution enshrined the right to keep, carry, and use, uh, and consequently of self-defense and the public militia power. 
Now, by the time we get to the 14th Amendment, the Privileges and Immunities Clause did incorporate an individual right to keep and carry arms. The Amendment's statutory companion, which was known as the Civil Rights Act of 1866, explicitly stated in Section 7 that it protected, quote, the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and a state, including the constitutional right of bearing arms for self-defense. And just kind of a fun fact, uh, that particular clause there was added specifically uh, as a means of using uh, Chief Justice Roger Tawney's racist dicta in the Dred Scott ruling against itself. Now, at one point in the ruling, Tawney stated that if free blacks could be citizens, that would give them the protection of constitutionality, uh, the protection of constitutionally protected rights, I should say, of all free citizens such as the right to keep and carry arms wherever they may go. So, how is it exactly that the Ninth Circuit could possibly conclude in the case of Young v. Hawaii that the en banc court affirmed that the district court's dismissal of an action challenging Hawaii's firearm licensee laws, which is for Hawaii, Revised Statute Section 134-9, Subsection A, which requires that residents seeking a license to openly carry a firearm in public must demonstrate, uh, quote, the urgency or the need to carry a firearm, that they must be of good moral character, and must be engaged in the protection of life and property. So, if you are asking yourself how the hell uh, did we go from uh, this huge long history, uh, I mean, going right back through the whole of liberal philosophy, English law, and early American law, and then come to uh, the Ninth Circuit saying something like that, uh, how could this be? Who do we, you know, who do we have to blame for this? And the person we have to blame is Justice Scalia. And it is really thanks to him that we have this whole mess where the Ninth Circuit decision requires, uh, it based admittedly on a very misleading interpretation of the case of D.C. versus Heller, uh, which is the 2008 Supreme Court case that found that uh, the Second Amendment right is an individual right to have an armed force self-defense in the home. But essentially... Uh, the ruling in Young v. Hawaii is one that can be parsed out uh, from Scalia's dicta in that case. Uh, and while the conclusion uh, that the Second Amendment uh, may now be a dead letter, thanks to Heller, may be a shocking conclusion, is, it is unfortunately not a surprising one. And this outcome was uh, really predicted almost prophetically uh, by I, I, the very first person I know of is Nelson Lund, who is a professor of law at George Mason University. Uh, now, Lund is one of the most eminent constitutional law scholars in the country and perhaps the most prolific modern Second Amendment scholar. Now, in 2008, while most of the Second Amendment advocates were cheering Scalia's ruling as his swan song uh, of original public meaning, Lund was virtually alone uh, voicing his concerns. Now, by 2015, some of the more pessimistic concerns about the way that not only D.C. versus Heller, but a follow-up case known as McDonald versus City of Chicago would be used uh, not to secure the right to keep and bear arms, but really to smother it, uh, became apparent in a dissent from a denial of certiorari uh, that was written by a very absolutely livid Justice Thomas when he said, the Supreme Court is treating the Second Amendment as a second-class right. The court routinely grants review in every case involving free speech, abortion, Fourth Amendment, search and seizure, you name it. They are adjudicating on it. Any and every possible provision of the Constitution you please, they will take a case. But they have treated the Second Amendment like a leper. They don't even want to touch it. So specifically, how did the Ninth Circuit possibly come to that uh, conclusion? 
Well, this is uh, uh, directly from the ruling that was handed down yesterday. It says, to answer that question, uh, and consistent with the Supreme Court's decision in District of Columbia versus Heller and McDonald versus City of Chicago, the en banc court first considered whether Hawaii's law affects conduct protected by the Second Amendment after careful review of the history of early English and American regulation of carrying arms in the public square, the en banc court concluded that Hawaii's restrictions on the open carrying of firearms reflect long-standing prohibitions and therefore the conduct they regulate is outside the historical scope of the Second Amendment. The en banc court held that the Second Amendment does not guarantee an unfettered general right to keep and carry arms in public for individual self-defense. Now, to figure out how this all came to be precisely, uh, we are going to uh, need to briefly talk about the legal system that we adopted from Great Britain. And during the 18th century, the majority of the laws uh, came from the ancient and unwritten custom that was known as the English common law. Over time, judges began to look at the decisions of prior judges to assess uh, what the ancient unwritten customary law required. They would start to answer new and novel questions by starting with these judicial precedents uh, that were based on analogy rather than, a, rather than deduction from first principles. The law would change over time as they met and faced new and novel challenges, but these changes were always so subtle as to be virtually imperceptible. Now, there was, by the 18th century, another set of laws that were known as statutes. Uh, they were then enacted by a joint uh, consent of Parliament and King. And while statutes were capable of overruling common law, in practice, the judges tended to apply statutes in a way that minimized any conflict with the common law. Now, this system remained remarkably stable for centuries, uh, even as great political changes and upheavals were going on. And I think, crucially, this happened because, as conflicts gradually took away power from the king and from parliament, or, I'm sorry, took away power from the king to parliament, more and more, uh, they began to exercise the power both of the legislature and of the high court of the land. Now, the king still did appoint judges, but those judges tended to remain subordinate to the will of parliament and with regard to the substance of their decisions. Uh, and their decisions at the time, it should be noted, were not final and they had no power to exercise what we would call today judicial review. Uh, and that is, of course, the ability to declare and act unconstitutional. Now, second, judges remain devoted to the common law and to common law modes of reasoning. However, this may sound obvious, but it was not inevitable. They understood their duty to be the application of English positive law, and even if the results were, to their mind, unjust or contrary to the high law, such as natural law, the system uh, in the, the system is the one that we inherited uh, following our independence. And in fact, our judges relied heavily on the common law and from time to time, as a matter of fact, they still do. Now, a key difference was that our adoption of a written constitution uh, on first the state and then on the national level meant that our courts were given a new kind of law to apply, uh, and it was assumed generally that they would interpret these new laws the way their predecessors had interpreted ordinary statutes, uh, and this is, by and large, what they did for a long time. Now, one major change that came immediately was because the constitutional law was a law superior to acts of the legislature, and that made it possible for the courts to directly overrule elected representatives. And this is the basis for the process of what we now call judicial review. This provision sparked a lot of controversy between Federalists and Anti-Federalists during the constitutional ratification debates of the 1787 and 1788. 
Now, the most well-known of these, uh, and the most expertly argued example, were the exchange that took place between an anti-federalist known as Brutus and Alexander Hamilton. In Brutus's letters 11, 12, and 15, he was rightly concerned with the probability that judicial review would visibly extend the court's power beyond its constitutional limits, making the judicial branch a potentially political body. Now, Hamilton directly responded to Brutus in Federalist 78 and 81, and he said that the judiciary was a branch that was too weak and timid to ever uh, treat the other two political branches. Uh, treat the other two, sorry, I lost my place. To treat the other two political branches uh, through an abuse of power of judicial review. Now, this largely uh, held true right up to the eve of the Civil War. And early jurists and scholars alike tried to ease fears by agreeing that the power should be used sparingly, and affirmed judicial review should only be applied in cases with clear constitutional violations. And in fact, judicial review was only used once between the period of the Constitution's enactment and the Civil War. And this came in 1803. And it was only used actually really uh, to invalidate a minor statute about the federal jurisdiction. Now, by the time Justice Scalia came to the court in 1986, the judiciary uh, bore little resemblance to Hamilton's timid and modest court. Early justices had actually initially uh, acted the way the founding generation had envis envisioned they would in interpreting the Constitution. They used tools that were already established under the English law for use for centuries of interpreting statutes. They generally aim to find the intent of the lawgiver by looking at the text and other meanings and purposes of the law. Now, they did adopt stare decisis, which assumes that prior judicial decisions were correct. And these aspects remained fairly stable until uh, the Warren Court. And this was the birth of the living constitution when the court began an aggressive and expansive adoption of old common law adjudication, and it was much less like a traditional statutory construction. And this came through three landmark developments. The first of these was Brown versus Board of Education, which, uh, despite its noble intention and positive outcome, is a decision that is completely bereft of any legal analysis whatsoever. It was a politically motivated decision that did not state what the law, but it did not state what the law was, but instead what they thought the law should be. Now, Brown did start out controversially, uh, especially in the South, of course, but in the end, this was a major victory for the court, who ended up scoring really a major political victory with this case. Now, because of the heady success, the court uh, began to grow ever bolder, imposing their own views of justice and salutary social policy for the nation. And most conspicuously uh, was the field of criminal civil procedure, and it dramatically expanded the rights of a criminal defendant during a period of escalating violent crime. This meant that the court did not garner the same kind of political victory here that came with Brown versus Board of, Board of Education and which they struck down Plessy. Finally, the court found a constitutional right to abortion in Roe versus Wade. And again, we have a case that is entirely bereft of legal analysis. Now, unlike Brown, the decision in Roe has remained perpetually controversial and politically poisonous. Following Brown, in the 1960s, the Congress passed statutes uh, such as the Civil Rights Act that not only affirmed Brown, but even expanded on Brown's vision of racial justice. Uh, conversely, though, following Roe, several states repeatedly found ways to express discontent and opposition to abortion rights granted in Roe. Now, before Scalia, 
really the, the preceding conservative justices who had been appointed to the court uh, after the New Deal practiced what could really be called judicial restraint. And they opposed the war in court's constitutional adventurism. Uh, certainly the most notable of these was William Rehnquist, who was a solid social conservative in his political views. But in his opposition of the living constitutionalist expansion, he adopted something much like the incrementalism of the old common law adjudication. Now, Rehnquist generally refined himself to resisting further expansion of the war and court doctrine and would occasionally cut it back, but he only was ever really at the most nibbling at the edges. Now, Scalia was not the first person to advocate for a constitutional originalism as a potential solution for expansive powers claimed by the New Deal era and the war in court. I, I believe the first well-known jurist to ever do this was Raoul Berger, uh, and this was in his brilliant book, Government by Judiciary, uh, which, which was released, I believe, in 1977, uh, and is absolutely worth checking out and finding if you're interested uh, in these kinds of topics. So, uh, by 1986, when Scalia came to the court, he came with his theory to undo judicial activism of the Warren Court doctrine fully formed. And by this, of course, I am talking about originalism. And specifically, a stream of originalism that he called original public meaning. That, really, just like if you were being asked to adjudicate a dispute over a private contract, how would you go uh, about finding the proper meaning of any vague wording or any word that has more than one potential definition. Now, in that case, you're certainly not going to just look up meanings in Black's Law, and you are not going to turn to the UCC. What you're going to do is you are going to ask the two parties who were the parties to the contract what the word or the clause in question meant to them and how they understood it to uh, be defined at the time when they entered into the contract. Now, Scalia quite properly said that the Constitution should be read uh, as a reasonably informed member of the public would have understood it to mean at the time of its drafting and ratification. And this actually squares very well with the place that the father of the Constitution, James Madison himself, urged later generations to look to. He urged people to look to the public debates that played out in the, conver uh, excuse me, in the conventions of the several states that met to debate and ratify the Constitution. So, fundamentally, what we find is that the Constitution is a legal instrument and it should be treated as such. Now, however, Scalia's uh, originalism was a really odd compromise. He tried to give both deference to stare decisis and originalist interpretation. Now, the Heller case was considered by both Scalia himself and by the large body of originalist scholars and jurists that had really developed in his orbit to be the biggest victory for his, the biggest victory for and the ideal culmination of everything that Scalia perceived to be right about originalism. So in D.C. versus Heller, the holding in its most basic sense found that the Second Amendment protected an individual right to keep a handgun in the home for purposes of self-defense. This case relies on an extensive body of legal research that began to gain prominence in the 1980s, and Scalia's opinion does make a compelling argument for two basic conclusions. First, it's meant to protect a private right of individuals to keep and to bear arms. It is not a collective right of state governments to maintain a militia as many people used to and some people still will claim. Second, the purpose of the Second Amendment is to protect a fundamental inherent right of self-defense against two distinct forms of oppression. The first is against a repressive government, and the second is defense against criminal violence from which the government either cannot 
or will not adequately protect individuals from. And this is a big thing that I think a lot of people don't really understand very well is when you talk about the Second Amendment and you talk about being an individual right of self-defense and they ask, well, what about the clause about the militia? It is that they're looking at uh, defense against an individual or a group of people as though these are two different things. And they really weren't to the founders. They really weren't. Um, th these were all the same thing, just in different degrees. If you're taking on a group of people such as a, uh, you know, a, a repressive government who has maybe sent uh, soldiers uh, to get people in line, I'm, you're going to defend yourself in a different way, but it's ultimately still an act of self-defense against oppression. Now, unfortunately, uh, nothing about uh, the answer that Heller gave to the question really got to the heart of the case. Remember, the heart of the case was, does the Second Amendment specifically protect uh, the right to have a handgun in the home for purposes of lawful self-defense? After all, the District of Columbia had banned possession of handguns, but it allowed people to have rifles and shotguns. It's not unreasonable to ask, why did that not satisfy the Second Amendment? Now, obviously, there was no discussion from the 18th century that could have possibly addressed that question since handguns weren't really something that existed back then. Uh, they had some early experimental models, but these were things that most people never had. Um, so, Scalia had to find another way to answer that question. And what he ended up saying was that the D.C. handgun ban was unconstitutional because, as he put it, quote, it amounts to a ban on an entire class of arms, which is chosen by American society for the purpose of lawful self-defense, end quote. And I do stress that word is for a reason. We'll get to that in a second here. Now, he went on to give a few examples of why he believed that that was reasonable. And he then said, whatever the reason, whatever the reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen for self-defense in the home, and a complete prohibition of their use is invalid, end quote. Now, here's the problem. That is not an originalist analysis. Its reliance on the popularity of handguns today looks a lot more like the kind of result-oriented living constitutional approach that Scalia had spent his entire career denouncing. Now, equally spurious is a small but very important addition that was added to D.C. versus Heller. These were sections that talked about banning guns, uh, first of all, in, quote, sensitive places, and then also a prohibition against, quote, dangerous and unusual weapons. And keep that in mind, dangerous and unusual weapons. We'll be getting to that significance here in just a second. And these two phrases uh, were certainly not put in there by Justice Scalia. I mean, it was his decision, but these were not things that he wanted to add to the opinion. You didn't have to know who had insisted they be in there to know that it wasn't Nino. Now, in time, we would find out that these phrases were added at the insistence of Chief, Chief Justice Roberts. And this is another example of completely forsaking any commitment to an original public meaning. Then, of course, two years later, we have the case of McDonald versus City of Chicago. Now, this was a case that was to decide if the Second Amendment was a right that was to be incorporated through the 14th Amendment against both the state and local governments. Now, Otis McDonald was an elderly black man who lived in a pretty, pretty bad neighborhood of Chicago, and he did not trust the Chicago Police Department to protect him in his home, which is a pretty smart move if you ask me. Um, and McDonald wanted to keep a gun in his house for protection. 
Now, McDonald did win the case with a five justice majority, declaring that the Chicago gun law was unconstitutional. However, while, while the decision got a majority, interestingly, the, the opinion did not. And what I mean is, is that there were uh, a four vote plurality to strike down the law through the application of what is known as substantive due process. While Clarence Thomas alone relied on the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And this is actually a very interesting topic in its own right. Uh, and this is something I have explored a little bit in past videos that I've done about the Second Amendment, uh, mostly in uh, my series To Keep and Bear Arms. It's a two part series. I go through the entire history of the whole case law of every case that has anything to do with the Second Amendment. And so the last case I get to is McDonald. Uh, I talk about it a little in there. Uh, but if this is something, if you guys would actually like a video on this and the uh, sort of the philosophical difference between substantive due process and privileges and immunities as it relates to the 14th Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms, let me know. It's an interesting topic. I'd be happy to make a video on it. Anyways, unfortunately, what didn't happen in McDonald is the court didn't say anything about the scope of the amendment. All it did was reaffirm what was already decided in Heller. Now, getting back to George Mason University's Nelson Lund, I mentioned earlier. Now, he quickly caught on to the fact that these cases uh, were not the win that most Second Amendment advocates assumed that they were. He said that even though the holdings in the case are consistent with the original meaning of the Second Amendment, that the dicta in the case would undermine future cases and make the Second Amendment a dead letter. Now, it's now been over a decade since Heller, and the court has yet to set a tier of judicial scrutiny for the Second Amendment. They have not clarified who bears the burden of proof in a Second Amendment case. It has not distinguished what weapons are protected. It has not said where they are protected. And it didn't take long before it started becoming evident that the most important opinion in Heller was not Scalia's majority, uh, and maybe even more surprising, wasn't even Justice Stevens' dissent. It was Justice Breyer's dissent, which he uh, issued on his own. Now, his dissent called for an interest-balancing approach. And this uh, protection of the Second Amendment right, if you can call this Thing that we are going to be talking about a protection, which I think is a dubious label to give it, uh, that essentially this approach affords the Second Amendment a protection uh, that falls well below any level of scrutiny, uh, even below rational basis scrutiny. Now, this is precisely what began to follow from Heller as the case was taken up uh, in the Court of Appeals. And almost all courts now have begun to follow suit and to use as their standard of review for gun laws in almost all inferior courts the interest balancing approach that was offered up by Justice Breyer. And this seems uh, to uh, unfortunately generally hold true both for conservative judges as well as for liberal justice, justices, uh, excuse me, liberal judges. Liberal judges. Yeah. Anyways, so Heller's uh, dicta seems to be doing more damage than the good done by the holding. And a good example is how the prohibitory language in Heller that prohibited weapons, and remember, I asked you to remember this, this language, weapons that are dangerous and unusual. Now, the most important word in there is the conjunctive and. On the other hand, when a Second Amendment case was referred back down to a lower court, uh, people like Judge Easterbrook in the Seventh Circuit uh, completely changed this around and decided that no, 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 it's not dangerous and unusual, it's dangerous or unusual. Now, the decision in Heller and the court's refusal to entertain any kind of new petitions about gun rights for the decades since Heller has meant 
that this kind of judicial malpractice that we are seeing just as one example in the Seventh Circuit, uh, and now with this new case, of course, in the Ninth Circuit, go entirely unchallenged as they proclaim, uh, even if something is common, if you call it dangerous, it can now be banned. So look at, for example, standard capacity magazines. Now, if a magazine has a standard capacity of more than 10 rounds, uh, there are millions and millions of magazines out there already that hold more than 10 rounds. There is no way that you can say a standard capacity magazine is in any way unusual. But it doesn't take a very creative mind to understand that merely claiming they are dangerous because more than 10 rounds can hurt more people than less than 10 rounds, you now have a basis for banning standard capacity magazines of over 10 rounds. And by the way, that language standard capacity magazine, you will always hear people use it as though they're talking about more, like more than 10 rounds uh, per se, or whatever random number they give it. That's not how you define a standard capacity magazine. Whatever the size of the magazine that came with the gun that you bought is, that is the standard capacity magazine. If you bought an AR-15 and it holds 30 rounds, that is a standard 30-round capacity magazine. So just be aware of that. When you hear people talking about high-capacity magazines, call them on that bullshit because that needs to be called out more often. It's not... Unless you are someone who goes and gets, um, I mean, I mean, you can certainly get modified magazines and you can get, have a AR-15 that maybe holds 30 round and you could procure for a lot of money a 100 round capacity magazine. Uh, and, and that would be a high capacity magazine because it's more than the standard 30. But just saying that, OK, anything more than 10, that's high capacity. That's bullshit. And that's what needs to be called out more. Often. So, after McDonald in 2010, we really didn't hear anything in the docket from the Supreme Court for the next session. And as 2011 became 2012, and as that became 2013, we were constantly reassured that we just need to be patient, we need to give it time and the court will clarify the doctrine. However, the Supreme Court has had nothing more to say about the issue. Every cert petition is denied year after year, denial after denial on every new Second Amendment case. Really, the right to keep and bear arms has been trapped somewhere between legal limbo and constitutional purgatory. The lower courts continue to whittle away at the Supreme Court's ruling in the District of Columbia v. Heller and McDonald v. Chicago, while the seven justices, uh, who, which are the seven except for uh, Scalia and Thomas up until that point, had really just been standing by quietly, refusing to say anything, refusing to intervene. Now, I say seven of the nine because twice in 2015, we saw examples where Justices Thomas and Scalia called out their colleagues for abdicating the judiciary safeguard of the Second Amendment. Now, first, the justices sat by uh, idly as San Francisco rendered it impossible for law-abiding citizens to keep a handgun for self-defense. Uh, second, the Supreme Court looked at other ways, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court looked the other way uh, as the Highland Park neighborhood in Illinois criminalized an entire class of rifles that are owned by millions of Americans. Now, it took us until 2019 to finally see the court grant cert on a new Second Amendment case. Now, what kind of case did they choose to review? Uh, would have been nice if they were looking at a case that dealt with the right to carry. Was that what they did? No. Maybe a case about the protection 
of AR-style semi-automatic rifles and carbines? No. Safe storage laws? No. It also didn't address magazine capacity. It didn't address the possibility of restoring gun rights to people who had previously been charged with non-violent crimes. The case they took up was the most narrow, insignificant, and obscure case they possibly could have. This was a case that was known as New York Rifle and Pistol Association versus the City of New York. Now, of those, for those of you out there who may not be familiar with this case, New York City has had an absurd law that said if you want to own a gun and you live in New York City, if you want to take that gun with you to go, say, to a shooting range, or if you have a second residence outside the city and you want to bring your gun with you to that other residence, uh, and when I say bring it to the other residents, I don't mean bring it holstered on your person. What I mean is that you have to transport that gun. Uh, if you are going to one of these very small number of valid places that you can even take it to begin with, you need to have the gun disassembled, locked inside a properly secured lockbox, and sitting in your locked trunk. And God help you if you are so reckless that you have your unloaded, disassembled, securely locked up gun, say in your back seat where it is 100% non-functional and 100% inaccessible, but it's not in the trunk. This is downright criminal, so say New York. Now, what's more, the problem with this case was that not only did you have to meet that insane burden just to take your gun from your home to the shooting range or from your home to your second home, and you couldn't take it anywhere else. But every single time you wanted to do this, you had to apply to the city to get a uh, permit with a special dispensation that was good for making that one trip uh, to wherever you were going and back again with the gun, and that was it. If you wanted to do it again in a couple days, you had to go get another new permit. This thing was just absolutely insane. Now, eventually, uh, this that case, uh, New York uh, made it moot, uh, and so the case was never really heard. Uh, but that is the first case that they were even willing to consider entertaining. So they had granted cert before uh, New York essentially. Uh, rescinded the law and made it moot. So, uh, all in all, what we find is that Scalia's greatest victory, uh, as, as he would think of it, uh, for originalism, turned out to be something that is not only uh, not truly originalist, but something that has little lasting effect. The court's bullish innovations in recent decades have no doubt uh, been, in my view, nothing more than perversions of the common law approach. They have generally employed what looks like more and more common law reasoning. Now, Heller's conclusion may be entirely consistent with the original meaning of the Second Amendment, uh, and I do believe that it is, but Scalia's failure to provide a genuinely originalist rationale for that precise result brings the entire jurisprudential project into question. Besides being untethered to originalism, the holding in Heller was very narrowly limited. Only a handful of jurisdictions had adopted handgun bans, so the decision really had almost no immediate effect. And now what we see uh, is even more damning opinion from the Ninth Circuit that says Heller holds citizens do not have a right to carry a gun on their person for lawful self-defense. Now, was that the outcome that Scalia had intended? Certainly not. Now, when he applied a reasonable textualist construction to the operative clause in the Second Amendment in the phrase uh, to bear arms, 
he properly pointed out that the language's most natural interpretation meant to carry arms as for private self-defense, and as such would be a weapon that you would be carrying on your person. Now, he made his meaning irrefutably clear in that part of the ruling. But, as with every other proper interpretation of the text that he provided in that case, all of his careful interpretation came to mean little to nothing when his dicta created multiple misinterpretations of the entire amendment, and in the end his opinion was even less than unhelpful. A careful read of the opinion's 50 pages uh, that is dedicated to only two clauses with multiple asides that confuse the plain meaning and with the addition of the wholly unoriginal and unsupported assertions in uh, that ruling such as those about dangerous and unusual weapons and about the ban of weapons in sensitive places have unfortunately provided the ammunition for gun grabbers to begin shooting down any kind of originalist interpretation. Really, Scalia's biggest victory may very well be the best friend that any of those who want to see the Second Amendment become a dead letter will ever have. Now, I, I just wanted to let you guys know, too, that uh, we obviously have uh, a lot of things going on right now as far as new gun control uh, coming up following what happened in Colorado. Obviously, there's been a huge push uh, by Democrats to try and get something passed, which is what they always have to do because a law is supposed to be passed on a cool and rational and just passionate basis of sound legal reasoning. And when they wait long enough to do that, nothing happens. So every time they have a chance to turn a crisis into an opportunity, uh, they try and pounce on it. So really, because of that, uh, I kind of see it uh, for the time being as my duty. <laughs> duty. To uh, try and cover this issue. Uh, specifically, as much as I can. Uh, so you're going to be seeing a lot more videos from me uh, lately or, or coming up here in the next couple of days and maybe a couple of weeks. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on Second Amendment issues. Uh, so, uh, for example, I'll be doing a breakdown of uh, the bill that Biden has been pushing, H.R. 127. Uh, we'll also probably be looking at some of the other bills, such as uh, H.R. 8 and H.R. 1416, that are also gun control bills that they are looking at. Uh, if Joe Biden tries to do something as stupid as pass gun control through an executive order, you can bet we will be looking at that executive order. And I will be doing what I normally do, what I did here today, which is breaking down these laws in a way that makes the information uh, uh, helpful and easily understood to lawyers and non-lawyers alike. But I just wanted to say that uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, about any of this gun control stuff that is coming up, or if you're curious about uh, the certain, uh, you know, maybe the ramifications of a proposed law, or you just want to hear about a particular topic that you've heard come up in the news that is related to this, or if you have just a question in general about various aspects of gun control that they are proposing or considering proposing, uh, if you want to... Uh, hear anything about that you guys should just let me know you can either leave a comment with any questions or suggestions uh down in the comment section of this video uh, or you can always email me it's categorical imperatives at gmx.com uh, and let me know any questions you have any suggestions any topics uh and it as long as it's something that i am uh qualified and capable to answer, I will absolutely get back to any request that you guys send me. So before we go here, I, I just want to uh, share with you uh, one quote from uh, a guy. Uh, he recently passed, unfortunately, but he was a really great guy. Uh, I knew through the libertarian movement and through the Constitution Society uh, named J. Neil Shulman. And he has a fantastic quote uh, that really uh, encapsulates uh, what we the, the message that we should be spreading uh, as friends of the Second Amendment 
when we hear all this talk about gun control and all this insane misinformation that is going on. And what Shulman had to say was, gun control advocates need to realize that passing laws that honest gun owners will not obey is a self-defeating strategy. Gun owners are not about to surrender their rights, and only the most foolish of politicians would risk the stability of the government by trying to use force of arms and force of the state to disarm the people. And so I think I will leave you there with that. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, if you like the show, uh, take a second and uh, smash that like button. Uh, you can leave me a comment. Let me know, did you agree with what I had to say? Did you disagree? Did, uh, did I change your mind on anything? Uh, do you think maybe you have a better argument on something and you think you can change my mind on something I discussed here today? Uh, please let me know. I, I really love hearing from you guys and communicating with you guys. I got a great, great, great amount of feedback uh, on my last video about assault weapons. Uh, that was really great to see. I really appreciate so many people uh, coming by and watching uh, the episode and leaving a thumbs up and leaving really good and interesting comments. And I got a lot of ideas from you guys from those comments for stuff I do want to talk about here coming up soon. Uh, so continue doing that. And then, uh, like I said, if you can help support the show financially, check the links down in the description and go and consider doing that. That would really, really be a great help. Uh, and if you can't, if you can't afford to or whatever, that's fine as well. Of course, I'm I'm really just happy that you guys are here and that you are giving me uh, your time uh, so we can discuss these topics together. Uh, and if you just keep uh, coming back to the show uh, and if you uh, just do a little bit to share the show, you know, when you hear a good episode, maybe just think of a friend or two you know who you think would like the show uh, and just send them a link to it and help me grow the channel that way. And if you guys would do that for me, I would be very grateful for that. So again, I want to uh, thank everybody here today. Uh, I will be back very shortly with another video here in the next day or two, uh, probably talking about the, uh, I think it's HR 147, the, the bill that Biden is pushing, the big gun control bill. I'll be doing a video about that very soon here. Uh, so I have been Lockheed Liberal. This has been Categorical Imperatives. Uh, and as always, Delenda est Carthago. <laughs>